Ladies and gentlemen, uh, distinguished guests, Secretary Baker, Chairman Sackler, Sana Sabag. Welcome to the Foreign Policy Association's annual Hasib Sabag Distinguished Lecture on Diplomacy. I'm Noel Latif, FPA's president, and I would like to pay tribute to the late Hasib Sabag before I turn the floor over to Sana, who will formally introduce Secretary Baker. As Senator George Mitchell observed when he delivered last year's lecture, few individuals have touched more people than Hasib Sabag. As a diplomat, as a business leader, and as a philanthropist, his contributions to the betterment of so many have been extraordinary. In the words of David Rockefeller, Hasib Sabag was a builder of hopes, as well as a builder on a grand scale. His name is synonymous with being a peacemaker and a builder of bridges of understanding. In the United States alone, his philanthropies included Georgetown University, Harvard University, the Cleveland Clinic, and the Council on Foreign Relations, to name a few. Mr. Rockefeller went on to say, when a man accomplishes so much but claims so little credit, we marvel at his humility. When his generosity reflects such extraordinary civic and social responsibility, we are moved by his selflessness. And when he serves his family, his company, his people, and his values with such conviction, we witness the real meaning of loyalty. <clears throat> At the Foreign Policy Association, we are grateful to Sana for endowing this lecture in memory of her father. Sana, the floor is yours. Good evening. When Deputy Secretary of State William Burns spoke at the Foreign Policy Association a few weeks ago, he was asked which of the six Secretaries of State under whom he served he most admired. Without hesitation, he responded, James Baker. Secretary Baker has served under three Presidents of the United States. He served as the 61st Secretary of State under President George Bush. During his tenure at the State Department, Secretary Baker traveled to 90 countries, responding to challenges and opportunities presented by the post-Cold War era. Secretary Baker served as well as the 67th Secretary of the Treasury under President Ronald Reagan. As Treasury Secretary, he was chairman of the President's Economic Policy Council. Secretary Baker's record of public service began in 1975 as Undersecretary of Commerce to President Gerald Ford. Long active in American presidential politics, Secretary Baker led presidential campaigns for Presidents Ford, Reagan, and Bush over the course of five consecutive presidential elections from 1976 to 1992. A native of Houston, he graduated from Princeton University in 1952 after two years of active duty as a lieutenant in the United States Marine Corps, he entered the University of Texas School of Law at Austin. He received his JD with honors in 1957. He received the Presidential Medal of Freedom in 1991 and has been the recipient of many other awards for distinguished public service. The United States, and indeed the world, are fortunate to have a statesman of Secretary Baker's integrity and vision. Secretary Baker and my father shared common values for world peace and prosperity and a great friendship and deep appreciation of one another. Secretary Baker, I want to thank you and I'm very grateful for your presence today. It gives me great pleasure to invite you to deliver this year's lecture in honor of my father.
Thank you very much, Sana. Those, that was an extraordinarily generous uh, introduction, and you were so right about my friendship with your father. Uh, I, like others, miss him, and he did such good work uh, around the world. Now, you talked about my having run five presidential campaigns for three different presidents, and I want to start, now, we're going to get serious here in a minute, but I first want to begin by, giving, by making a confession to you. I never in my life intended to go into politics and public service. I had a grandfather who ran the law firm, my family law firm down in Houston, and his, he used to tell the young lawyers that came to work there, if you want to be a good lawyer, work hard, study, and keep out of politics. So that mantra governed the first 40 years of my life. And I did, I was almost a well, I was apolitical. Uh, uh, Barbara Bush said he didn't even vote except to, it, primarily because election day was on the opening day of the hunting season, so he wouldn't vote. But I, 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 I really followed my grandfather's advice until a series of events occurred, some tragic and some happy, that led me into a second career in politics and public service. And the first tragedy was the loss of my wife to cancer when she was only 38 years of age. And uh, I had a friend, though, in Houston, Texas, whose name happened to be George Bush. And he came to me and he said, you know, Bake, you've got to take your mind off your grief. How about helping me run for the Senate here in Texas? I said, well, George, that's a great idea, except for two things. Number one, I don't know anything about politics. And number two, I'm a Democrat. <laughs> he said, well, we can fix that latter problem. <laughs> and we did. And when I'm talking to a room full of Republicans, I say I got religion. And when I'm talking to a mixed crowd, I say I changed parties. So you can, <laughs> you can take it any way you want. But anyway, I did. And I helped him in that race. And it was a good race. We lost it narrowly to a very fine uh, uh, public servant for Texas and the United States, Lloyd Benson. Uh, but one thing led to another after that, and I came up to Washington as Jerry Ford's Deputy Secretary of Commerce. And then the second tragedy struck that led me into politics and public service. Uh, Jerry Ford's delegate hunter in his race for the Republican nomination against Ronald Reagan was killed in an automobile accident. And President Ford asked me to go over and, and lead the charge uh, collecting delegates. If in the last seriously contested uh, convention or nomination fight that went to the convention of either major political party, this was in 1976 in Kansas City. And I was Ford's delegate hunter, and we barely won that nomination over Governor Reagan. Here, here we were, a sitting president, barely won the nomination over Governor Reagan with about, I think, 30 to 35 votes out of some 3,500 votes that were on the floor. Well, that was interesting. And after the, uh, after the nomination fight, President Ford asked me if I would chair the general election contest against Jimmy Carter, which I then did. And we lost that barely. 10,000 votes out of 81 million votes that were cast. You turn 10,000 votes around in Iowa and uh, Hawaii and Ford would have been president, Carter would never have been president. Well, all that served to really, uh, to really sting me with the bug of politics. And so I came home to Texas and I thought, well, I've been a lawyer for 22 years. I'm going to try my hand at this political game. So I filed to run for statewide office in Texas. And in those days, Texas was every bit as Democratic as it is Republican today. It was solidly Democratic. We had not elected a Republican statewide in Texas since John Tower in a special election for, to fill the seat of Lyndon Johnson when he went on the ticket for, with John Kennedy. So there I am, and I never will forget one hot summer day I'm I'm way up in the Panhandle somewhere, a little town, maybe it was Lubbock or something, and I see these people standing, on a, uh, standing at a shopping center, and I go over to give them some campaign literature. And I stick out my hand to introduce myself to this guy standing there, and before I can say a word, he says, say, did anybody ever tell you you look like Jim Baker? <laughs> and I said, I sort of swelled up with pride, and I said, Yes, often. He never batted an eyelash. He said, doesn't it piss you off? <laughs> well, that was the first clue I had that I might not win that race. For, for, and sure enough, I didn't, and that's the reason I had an opportunity to, to, to come up to Washington, D.C. 
thank you uh, for having me here and particularly for asking me to present a lecture uh, named after my friend Hasib. Hasib Sabah really did work tirelessly to bring leaders of the various factions in the Middle East together in the name of peace. And you know, in many ways he was successful, but sadly, as we all know, peace there remains very elusive. I really had a special relationship with Hasib, and I considered him, and still consider him, a close friend. He and Sana have been generous supporters of the James Baker Institute for Public Policy at Rice University, and have endowed a chair there in Middle Eastern Studies in name, named after uh, Hasib's late wife, Diana Tamara, Tamari Sabah. So it's really a delight to be here, Sana, and particularly because that you're here and that this lecture is named uh, after Sabah. Uh, I've been asked to share my thoughts with you today, ladies and gentlemen, on the ambiguous legacy of the Arab Spring. And I'll do that, but I want to start by touching briefly on the complex and confusing course of events since that uh, uh, wave of, since the wave of demonstrations began back there in 2010, late 2010. And then I want to spend a little time on two other issues, the first of which is the impact of the Arab Spring on U.S. interests in a region of serious ge geopolitical importance to uh, this country. And second is what I see as perhaps the proper policies we should follow if we are going to successfully navigate the disorder that has followed that Arab Spring. When a Tunisian street vendor immolated himself in protest on December 17, 2010, he really did initiate a chain of events that forever changed the history, not just of his own country, but of much of the Middle East and North Africa. Within months, if you followed the news, you saw protests stretching from Morocco to Iraq. While these protests were shaped by local circumstances, they nevertheless reflected a broad-based revulsion against autocratic rule, endemic corruption, and lack of economic opportunity throughout much of the Arab world. Like many in 2011, I was initially exhilarated by the protests that were then rapidly spreading across the Arab world. And as a citizen of a country that was founded by a revolt against tyranny, how could I not be so moved? My hope was that we were witnessing something akin to the democracy movements that swept the former Soviet bloc in 1989 when I had the good fortune to be Secretary of State. While the transition to democratic government in Central and Eastern Europe was not seamless, it nevertheless proved powerful and irreversible. I was hopeful, quite hopeful actually, that the Arab Spring might take a similar course, but that optimism even then was tempered with a substantial amount of caution. After all, I knew the Middle East pretty well as my time, from my time as Secretary of State, and most of the countries in the region had little history with anything resembling representative democracy. Many were fragile states with sharp tribal, religious, ethnic, and political divisions, only held in check too often by harsh and autocratic rule. Not least, though, some of the regimes that were threatened as the Arab Spring gathered momentum, notably, for instance, that of uh, Egypt's Hosni Mubarak, were long-standing strategic partners of the United States. I was old enough, frankly, to remember another popular revolution, the overthrow of the Shah of Iran in 1979 that both failed to deliver true democracy and through, as, through U.S. Middle East policy into complete disarray. In retrospect, I think my caution about the Arab Spring was warranted. Yes, autocrats were overthrown in Tunisia, Egypt, Libya, and Yemen, but only in Tunisia has any form of democratic governance taken real, if still tentative, roots. After a short and disastrous experiment under Muslim Brotherhood President Mohamed Morsi, Egypt is again governed by a former military officer like his predecessors, Nasser, Sadat, and Mubarak. Both Libya and Yemen 
have been plunged into utter chaos. The same is true of Syria, where the regime of Bashar al-Assad continues to cling to power in what is now a savage civil war. The conflict in Syria, in turn, has provided an opening for the Islamic State, also known as ISIS or ISIL, which has posted alarming territorial gains, both there and even more disturbingly, in Iraq. Whatever its original impetus, the Arab Spring has since contributed to a breakdown in domestic order that has unleashed long-simmering religious, tribal, ethnic, and political divisions across the entire region. While many of those divisions are domestic, they play out against very much broader regional rivalries. One such rivalry is sectarian. The Shia-Sunni split within Islam is surely not the only important factor driving events in the Middle East, but it is a very powerful one. In countries like Syria, Yemen, and Iraq, sectarianism has both fostered and intensified domestic conflicts. It has also helped internationalize those conflicts. Shiite Iran, for instance, supports the Shiite-led governments in Damascus and Baghdad. Tehran also supports Shiite Houthi rebels in Yemen. Saudi Arabia and other Sunni states, in contrast, have thrown in their lot with anti-regime Sunni factions in Syria and have intervened militarily to stop the Houthi advance in Yemen. Another factor shaping Middle East events is the long-standing geopolitical rivalry between Iran and Saudi Arabia, both of which I think probably have ambitions to be the dominant regional player in the Arabian Gulf. In other words, Saudi Arabia's fear of expanding Iranian influence in Yemen and elsewhere is not merely based on religion. It is not merely a religious fear. It is also very strategic. To make a confusing situation even more fraught, the disorder prompted in part by the Arab Spring has created opportunities for extremist Sunni groups like Al-Qaeda and its affiliates, and most notably ISIS. In Syria, this state of affairs has helped create what could be called a three-sided civil war among the Syrian government, moderate rebels, and extremist factions such as ISIS and Jabhat al-Nusra. The three-sided nature of some of the sharpest conflicts in the Middle East region today can create some extraordinarily strange alignments of interest. We've seen that. In Iraq, for instance, we find ourselves in an informal de facto partnership with Iran, believe it or not, in the international effort to roll back ISIS's gains. In the short to medium term, there's little doubt that the disorder engendered by the Arab Spring has, has been injurious to U.S. interests in the region. Chief among those interests is stability. Syria, a state that abuts key U.S. allies such as Israel and Turkey, is in its fourth year of a very vicious civil war. Iraq has again erupted into outright violence, with ISIS making large territorial gains in Sunni Arab parts of the country. The situation in Yemen remains extraordinarily dangerous. While the Saudi-led and U.S.-endorsed military intervention there is justified, it raises the prospect of a nasty, protracted proxy war between Iran and Saudi Arabia, which in my view, ladies and gentlemen, today is a distinct possibility. Let's hope it's not a probability. Let's hope it doesn't happen, but it's a possibility. To make matters worse for U.S. interests and those of Israel, Saudi Arabia, UAE, and other American allies in the Middle East, one nation is gaining influence even as all these conflicts rage, and that's Iran. Iran has been emboldened by the chaos across the region and is poised to become a stronger, and more active influence there. Iran's support of Houthi rebels in Yemen is the latest example, I think, of the kind of meddling that we've seen in the past from Tehran. 
Iran also backs Hezbollah in Lebanon, the Assad regime in Syria, and Shia militias in Iraq. Of course, it is true that Iran's proxies are fighting ISIS in Syria and Iraq, and I suppose you could say that's a positive development if your goal is to destroy ISIS. But it is also true that ISIS would never have gained such traction in the first place if not for the actions of Iranian clients in Syria and Iraq. Left unchecked, Iran's ambitions appear aimed at becoming a regional hegemon, a daunting possibility for a country that already is the world's largest state sponsor of international terrorism, a potential existential threat to Israel, and a vociferous opponent of the United States. We must recognize, I think, that America's biggest mid to long-term challenge in the Middle East could very well be how we respond to the emergence of Iran. So you ask yourselves, okay, how should U.S. policymakers respond to this instability? Let me spare you a comprehensive point-by-point -point strategy because I don't have one. Instead, I would like to suggest three general factors three general rules for approaching the current tumult in much of the Middle East. First of all, I think we need to, make, we need to understand that this is, this is a country by country phenomenon. Uh, and we should address it on a country by country basis. Uh, the, the conflicts and the disturbances are not all of exactly the same nature. While its initial, initial reach was uh, region-wide, the actual course of the Arab Spring and its aftermath differed dramatically depending upon the nature of the individual state. For instance, Middle Eastern monarchies, with the exception, of course, perhaps of Bahrain, by and large weathered the initial wave of discontent without any major threats to their survival. On the other hand, more conventional autocracies in Tunisia, Egypt, Yemen, Libya, and Syria proved to be extremely vulnerable. Second, I think we must be realistic in our steadfast support for democracy and human rights. Please note that I said be realistic. I do not suggest that we should abandon those principles which form the foundation of our foreign policy. But we need to be realistic about democracy and human rights. We have long served as a forthright advocate of democratic principles around the world, and we should, and I think we will, continue to do so. But we must also recall, and the Arab Spring really reminds us of this, that the path to democracy is difficult, it's unpredictable, and at times it's liable to lead to the sort of disorder where freedom is least likely to flourish. Moreover, we must by necessity deal with governments that fall short of our standards of democracy and human rights. It would be great if this were not so, but it is so, and there's nothing we can do about that if we want to protect and advance the national security interests of the United States. Unless we are prepared to forego our influence in some of the world's most strategically important regions of the world, we must accept this fact that we must be more realistic in our support of democracy and human rights. And that leads me to my third and last point. We must never, ever, ever forget our vital interest in the region. I've already mentioned stability, but we have other interests as well. One of those, of course, is the security of Israel. The civil war in Syria, and particularly the rise of extremist groups such as ISIS and al-Nusra, presents a significant potential threat to Israel. Equally worrisome, in my view, would be instability, serious instability in Jordan. To date, this thankfully has failed to materialize. But any challenge to the Jordanian regime is something to which I think the United States should be prepared to respond, if necessary, by military means. Another key interest, of course, is the undisturbed flow of Arabian Gulf oil to world markets. 
Here, I think we find ourselves in a pretty fortunate position. Thanks in large part to the expansion of shale oil production here in the United States, there is abundant supply now in world markets and substantial downward pressure on petroleum prices. And further, ISIS's gains in Iraq have largely been in areas with little oil production. Indeed, Iraqi petroleum output, largely from the Shia-dominated south of Iraq, is running at historically high rates. An ISIS offensive into major Iraqi production areas, however, would surely roil oil markets. We should also do what we can to ensure that our own oil flows unimpeded into international markets. Our, our oil has not been flowing into international markets since Jimmy Carter was president. Now we've got a surplus, a surfeit of oil, and we ought to figure out a way to export that. It would be good for our national security interest, and it would be good for instability in that part of the world. It would actually be good for the global economy. So we need to reverse our counterproductive policy banning crude oil exports. That would be an important and long overdue step that we should take. Another critical American interest in the Middle East is our support of nonproliferation. We have a general interest in limiting the spread of nuclear weapons around the world, but we also have a very specific interest in avoiding proliferation in the Middle East, which is one of the globe's most conflict-prone regions. This brings me to the agreement currently being negotiated between Iran and the so-called P5 plus one, that is the five members of the United Nations Security Council plus Germany. On April 2nd, when negotiators announced a framework agreement that could keep Iran from developing a nuclear weapon for at least 10 years, I, for one, was cautiously optimistic. No, it didn't look to me like it was a strong deal. I still don't think it is. I don't think it's one that would make it, Im it is not a deal that will make it impossible for Iran to acquire a nuclear weapon. Serious questions, though, arose shortly after the announcement of the framework agreement when Iran indicated it would agree to a final deal, but only as long as sanctions currently imposed against Iran are dropped when the agreement is signed and not phased out over time when Iran reaches benchmark goals as the White House had indicated in their paper announcing the framework agreement. There were other problems as well, problems with the verification mechanisms, including access to Iran's military bases for inspections, problems with the snapback provisions for reapplying sanctions if Iran uh, uh, violates the agreement, and problems with Iran's refusal to provide historical information about its nuclear enrichment program so that there is a baseline against which to measure any future enrichment. Hopefully, those and other shortcomings can be worked out between now and the self-imposed June 30 deadline for a final agreement, because the last thing the region needs is a nuclear arms race that would surely follow if Iran is to get the bomb. And so a negotiated agreement appears to be the best alternative to me, short of taking military action, assuming that agreement is verifiable and assuming it is a good agreement. As things stand not right now, I have serious doubts about that. But I also have extremely serious doubts about military action, because military action would strengthen the hardliners in Tehran it would have other adverse and unforeseen consequences. And, and further, it would probably only delay Iran's race to the bomb and not prevent it, not permanently prevent it. But let me add here, uh, before I move to another topic, that I think it's very important that we not rule out the use of force, that the United States not rule it out. If, if it looks like uh, the Iranians are about to uh, uh, militarize, about to weaponize, about to get the bomb, then I think we need to do what we need to do, including uh, military force to take it out. Because experience has demonstrated to us that Iran cannot be trusted. And so we very well may have to use force to see what we can do about halting that weapons program. The, the, the use of force, I guess my bottom line is the use of for, 
of force should remain an option. It should be a last resort option. Let me close, ladies and gentlemen, and go to your questions, which I'm happy to do, because I think people are more interested in, we're not ready yet. I think people are more interested in, just a minute, I'm not finished. I'll let you know when I'm finished. People are more interested in question and answers because then we can talk about what you want to talk about rather than what I want to talk about. So we're not ready to go there yet, but let me say one final thing before we get there. I want to say a word about the Arab Spring and its effect on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Ironically enough, I think the Arab Spring has had only a modest direct effect on Palestinian politics. The West Bank remains under the firm control of the Palestinian National Authority, and Hamas still rules Gaza. During the brief government of, of Morsi in Egypt, Hamas could look to a staunch ally in Cairo. Egypt was a staunch ally of Hamas at that time. With Morsi's fall, however, relations between Hamas and Egypt can best be described as frigid. Of course, resolving the Israeli-Palestinian dispute remains an important American goal in the region. Last year's eruption of violence between Hamas and Israel is evidence, I think, of just how vile, volatile the situation remains. The failure of uh, Secretary Kerry's peace initiative was a disappointment to a lot of us who spent an awful lot of time trying to promote peace uh, in that area and on that issue. And circumstances today sure don't look very propitious for another attempt, but I don't think that means we give up hope. Sooner or later, I think the, uh, the Palestinian body politic and the Israeli body politic are going to want to stop being uh, entities perpetually at war. And I think in the medium to long term, one of these days, somewhere down the line, maybe in the lifetimes of some of you younger folks out there, maybe we'll get there. But anyway, I think we ought not to give up hope, but we, things don't look really good right now. The only, the only outcome in the long run, in my opinion, that will not make it difficult, if not impossible, for Israel to maintain both its Jewish character and its democratic character is a two-state solution. I remain hopeful, but realistic, of course, about the prospects uh, of, of finding a way to get to a two-state solution. Similarly, ladies and gentlemen, I'm cautiously hopeful about the future of the Middle East. I know I've painted a very dire uh, picture here, and it is dire. Today, it's not good at all. But I think we would make a mistake to totally dismiss what's the forces that are at play over there in terms of, of where they may take us uh, a number of years from now. We're talking, after all, about a phenomenon that's less than five years old. But when we consider its heavy toll from the suffering inflicted upon innocent people to the destructions of homes and schools and churches, the Arab Spring has unleashed incredible instability and untold cruelty rather than fostering human dignity. Decades from now, decades from now, it might be looked upon as the opening salvo, salvo of an ultimately successful battle for democracy and human rights in the Middle East. Might be. I'm not saying it will be. If I had to bet today, I would probably bet against it. But we're betting, we're looking at it from a short-term perspective. As we consider that optimistic scenario, though, we should also remember something from the United States' history. It was 12 years after the Declaration of Independence was signed that the Founding Fathers finally crafted a workable constitution, establishing a government that has lasted more than 230 years now. The situation in the Middle East today is, of course, much more fractious than it was in America in 1776. And so it could take much longer for, uh, for anything approaching uh, stable democracies to emerge there, if they're ever going to emerge. But at some point, somewhere down the road, the desire for freedom and the hope for human rights and human dignity is going to lead people, even, under, even people who are fighting the way they are today, uh, to, to look to that as a, as a way of salvation. While we're waiting, while history unfolds, 
All we can really do is carefully identify our interests country by country, shrewdly deploy our power to defend those interests, and prepare ourselves for what is very likely to be an extraordinarily rocky ride. Thank you all very, very much. <laughs> Now, Noel, are you going to moderate this? You know, you know who. Well, I want questions, not speeches, so I thought maybe you could. I thought maybe you'd moderate. My marching orders here. Let's start from the back of the room there. With respect to your point about the oil, it's a mystery why that hasn't occurred. One would think that it would be a concurrent interest of all significant groupings in America. And I wonder if you could speak to why you think it's taking such a long time for that process to be birthed. You mean to, 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 to release the ban on exporting oil? Exactly. Well, you've got something called the Jones Act, for one thing. There are lots of, you know, there are lots of entrenched interests in our democracy that like, sometimes like to keep things the way they are. They don't want to see any change. Uh, and I don't know exactly what all those interests are. I, for one, if, as you noted from my remarks, I think it would be an extraordinarily good thing for the country and for the world if we could get rid of that anachronism. But politics is politics. Whether we get rid of it or not, I'm not sure. <laughs> Whether we will or not, I don't know. There are a lot of people, you know, that, that, that want us, that don't want they, they like cheap fuel. I mean, uh, for one, a, a, a big corporation in my home state is fighting it tooth and nail because they can buy feedstocks, they can buy oil to, to make chemicals at a very cheap price. Congressman? Mr. Secretary, number one, what do you think of just Bush's chances of getting the Republican nomination? Well, you know, you, you don't. And number two, what do you think of his chances against Mrs. Clinton? Well, I can answer that very quickly for you. His chances, I think he's going to get the Republican nomination, and let me tell you why. He's going to have money, and he's going to have staying power, and the Republicans have learned a lesson from the last campaign. They've moved a lot of their stuff forward. Florida, remember this, Florida is now going to be a winner-take-all state. It's about the third largest delegates to rich state in, in the country. He should take Florida. Marco Rubio will give him a little problem there, but they're not going to proportion those delegates. They're all going to be give, given to the winner, and I think that's a very good leg up for him. But more importantly, as the later contests come along with the, in delegate rich states, I think he's going to still have the wherewithal to, to conduct a campaign. So, but now that's said to you with a great deal of bias because you know my, my relationship with the Bush family. I still believe that. It's, it's what I think. Uh, I think Hillary's vulnerable. I've said that. I said it on Face the Nation. I said it in a number. I think she's vulnerable. And um, part of it is that um, she's been on the scene for a long time now. People generally like to vote for, they're sort of futuristic in their voting decisions. And this is a ret real return to the past. You can say what you want to about the Bushes having been there before, but he, this is a different person. He hadn't been, of course he hadn't been first lady. He hadn't, but he hadn't been, you know, he, he hadn't been part of a group that's been in power for quite a bit. Yeah. Uh, what is your opinion of Obama's concept of leading from behind? Not much. <laughs> but you know, here's the thing. I'm, a, I, I'm an adversarial Republican, so when you look at me and to talk about foreign policy, I take off the po political hat, and we've been talking here tonight about foreign policy issues. But I don't think you lead from behind. And I think part of what's going on out there, and, and I mean, a lot of things are going bad. And it's not just in the Middle East. Look at Russia, look at Venezuela, look at Latin America, look at uh, uh, Bolivia, Ecuador, Argentina. They're all, you know, when, when I left office, of course it was 25 years ago now, 
There was only one, only one dictatorship in Latin America, and that was Cuba. Everybody else were, was embracing democracy and free market. We're going in the other direction now. But anyway, I don't think you lead from behind. I do believe this. I, I, I really support President Obama in, in refusing to put American boots on the ground to resolve some of these conflicts in the Middle East. I really support that. I think we've had we had quite enough of young American men and women uh, bleeding to death in the sands of the Middle East. Forget it. We ought not to be doing that anymore. That doesn't mean you can't lead. There are many ways that you can lead without putting boots on the ground. I can't for the life of me understand why we haven't gone to our Sunni Arab allies in the Middle East when ISIS first showed up. It, the president says our goal is to degrade and destroy ISIS. Okay. You can't do that just with air. You have to take territory. You can't take territory with air. Why didn't we? Why don't we go to the Saudis and the UAE and uh, Jordan and, and other countries in the region, the, the Arabian Gulf countries, and also to Turkey, a longtime ally and, and a fellow member of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, say, hey, we all have the same goal here. We want to destroy ISIS. We'll furnish the logistics, the intelligence, and the air, and you put the boots on the ground. Why haven't we done that? Um, this is Diana Mr. Secretary, in 1990 and 91, you negotiated with Shamir over a future dialogue between the Palestinians and the Israelis. Mr. Shamir was as difficult as Benjamin Netanyahu. What advice do you have for the administration as they seek to work with Netanyahu? Well, uh, what you say, of course, is true. I remember when Bibi was first elected in his first term as prime minister some time ago. Uh, my pal Itzhak Shamir went out and said he's too squishy, he's too soft. That was the Israeli prime minister I dealt with. So Shamir, there were no more hardline prime ministers than Shamir. Uh, but I gotta tell you something, he, he and I had an extraordinarily good personal relationship. We differed on policy in many, many respects. But he never leaked on me, he never made a promise to me that he wouldn't keep. And, and we, you know, we worked through all those difficulties. Uh, we gotta work through them again today. That's what I think we need to do. I think it's unfortunate that the, uh, that the relationship that today has become so personal. And you can't get anywhere in di diplomacy if you can't trust or if you dis totally dislike the person across the table. And uh, while, while oh, Shamir and I had vast differences on policy, as you know, we nevertheless had an extraordinarily good personal relationship. I think we need to get back to that kind of diplomacy. Uh, over there on the side of the road. Mr. Secretary, it's an honor to be in the room with you. Just have a quick question in relation to the terrorism that's happening. Uh, knowing that the majority of the atrocious acts perpetrated either against the US in 9-11 or what ISIS is doing now are done mostly by people who come from allied countries to the United States, whether it's Saudi Arabia, whether it's Pakistan, whether it's a lot of the Sunni countries in the Middle East, is there any lesson for us to be learned from what happened with the other regimes in the Arab Spring in the way that we are supporting these current regimes now and try to learn something about what to do going forward for the day where eventually those countries might themselves go through another version of the Arab Spring? Well, I don't think you condemn, uh, you condemn each country that uh, has jihadists leaving their country to go do jihad. I don't see how you can condemn. Now, now you know, we, we have in the past had some differences with some of our uh, more moderate Arab allies in, in the Gulf, 
uh, with respect to the aid that they furnish to madrasas around the world that, that, that preach some of this violence and preach some of this hate. And we raise those with them. And, but I don't think you can condemn entire countries just because you have uh, citizens of those countries joining up with ISIS. The big, one of the big problems, of course, is that a lot of the young men in the region don't have jobs and they don't have anything to do, and they, they're easily radicalized. And in today's social media environment, uh, it's easy to, to, uh, to entice them with, uh, with tales of, of how wonderful jihad is and how if you come do it, you get 60 virgins in heaven. I mean, that's what's happening to us. We're getting, we're getting beat bad uh, on social media. But at the end of the day, you're not going to be able to, you're not going to be able to reason with those people. At the end of the day, the president is right when he says our goal should be to, to uh, destroy uh, groups like that. I mean, you can't excuse that that inhuman cruelty. But I don't think you condemn uh, whole countries, and particularly when those countries have been working with you uh, against those very same types of people in, in, in the region. You know, we get an awful lot of, of support from the Gulf monarchies, Saudi Arabia, UAE, and others, in our fight uh, against terrorism. To a lot of cooperation. And yes, you have some Saudis who are, going over, who are joining ISIS, but you got a lot of Europeans joining ISIS and you got 150 Americans joining ISIS. What are we going to do about that? That's where that's really dangerous for us. So we we do need we do need to focus on this threat. It's a serious threat. But we need in focusing on it, we need to lead from in front. coming. My question is, do you believe there's room for a louder, moderate voice in, in Islam to speak about how the different sects of Islam are choosing military means to settle their differences, or you've got extremists which are choosing violence? One of the things I'm surprised we don't hear more of is the moderates of that religion in particular speaking up. I think it's really important, excuse me, really important that these countries that are allied with us uh, and other moderate uh, regimes speak up and condemn what's going on. It's really important. This is a war within Islam, okay? It's, it's dangerous to us, but it's really a war between, uh, between the radicals and the, and, uh, the moderate Islamists. And so we need to hear that. We need to hear from those uh, countries that, that, that that nothing, that they don't abide this type of behavior either. So I, I agree with you. I don't know that it needs to be a more moderate voice, but we, we need to hear more, more volume from those countries that are our allies, particularly. I don't know if it's permissible to ask a non-Mideast question, but since the congressman did, I'll try. Since we have you here, how do you assess Mr. Putin and his repressive policies, and how should we handle it? Well, I think we, uh, I hate to say, but I don't think we're being strong enough. Uh, I, I believe we, we, we run the risk of having seen this movie before. Uh, we saw it in the late 30s. I mean, that may be too strong. A, an analogy, but it's, it sure looks a lot like it. Uh, you can't, uh, the President of the United States can't go out and say to the President of Russia, if you keep doing what you're doing in eastern Ukraine, there are going to be serious consequences. And he keeps doing it, and so we go, we told you there'd be serious consequences. You can't do that. And, but now, having said all that, we got to bring our, our European allies along on sanctions. Sanctions are working. 
the price of oil is working better by denying the Russians. But you know what Putin has done is inconsistent with any concept of a stable world order. You can't, if you don't like what's going on next door, you, you can't just roll the tanks. So we need to be doing more, but having said that, we need to be bringing our European allies along. With respect to the Iran nuclear agreement, we need to be, I mean, you know, one, one other approach that I didn't mention because I don't think it's doable would be to ratchet up sanctions. If we could do that, that would be wonderful. We can do it here in the United States, but they wouldn't be successful in the way they are if they're UN sanctions and EU sanctions. And if we are seen to be, if the lack of domestic support in the United States is seen to be the reason this agreement goes down, then we really would never be able to get the Germans, the British, the French, and the European Union. You know, the European Union sanctions come, on, come off unless they're affirmatively voted to be, to be maintained. And so it, that's not a very good... But we need to be stronger with respect to Ukraine. It's, uh, I think if he fools around with any NATO country, we will be. Uh, just a little bit about uh, China and North Korea. Mm -hmm. It doesn't seem to me that North Korea listens to anybody except maybe China. And That's I'm right. just curious as to your thoughts on that. That's right. No, you're absolutely right. China's the key to, to uh, trying to modify uh, North Korean behavior. And the Chinese have in the past gotten upset with them from time to time. They were upset with them not too long ago. Uh, but they don't, you know, they're, they're deathly afraid that, they're, that the regime will collapse and they'll have hundreds of thousands of refugees flooding into China. And they also, they're also allied because of strategic interests against South Korea, Japan, and the United States. Uh, but but China's, the, China's where it's at. You know, we, we did a framework agreement with North Korea in 1994. This was a year, two years after we left office. And at the time, we, we, we criticized that agreement. It was not unlike this agreement we're talking about doing with Iran. Uh, and at that time, we had a really strong policy against North Korea, but we changed it. And we went to this diplomatic track, and we made an agreement with them. And of course, they promptly uh, uh, abrogated it. So we, do need, to be, we need to, do need to be concerned about North Korea. China is where it's at. That's yet, yet another good reason why we need to get along with China. We have a huge interest in maintaining the best possible relationship we can with China, and they have a huge interest in maintaining the best possible relationship they can with us. And how American policymakers uh, relate to the, to the rise of China on the one hand and the rise of Iran on the other are two of the most important geopolitical issues facing our policymakers. With China, let me say one final thing. We're going to have tensions with China, but that doesn't mean they have to be our enemy. They could be if we make them our enemy. But we've got areas where we can where we cooperate with them. The Iran nuclear stuff is one. Uh, terrorism is one. Maybe trade, other things, stability in the Pacific. We have we have areas where we where we disagree with them. Taiwan, Tibet, human rights, maybe currency. All the currency is getting better. So what we need to do with China is cooperate where we can, where we have a convergence of interests. And where we don't, we need to manage those differences. And I think that the Chinese are of the same view. I mean, you, you, we'll see. Right here. Uh, Secretary Baker, when you are in office. Will you speak into the microphone, please? Yeah. yeah. The U.S. and the GCC had an excellent relationship. There was a great deal of consultation. Today, the relationship seems cool, and the Gulf states feel uncomfortable about the Iranian threat. What can the U.S. do to enhance their self-confidence? Well, I think what the United States can do is what it looks like they've started doing. They've got all of the uh, Gulf states coming to Washington to talk, I'm sure, about security assurances 
and, and uh, weapons, uh, provisioning of weapons. I know that's what they're going to be talking about. And that's good, and that's what we ought to be doing. Uh, the, the, the thing I think that really, that really upset a lot of the GCC countries was when we went to Oman, uh, and when we went, sat down with the Iranians in Oman and never told our allies about it. Hi, Dick. How are you doing? I'm all right. With the benefit of hindsight, should we have gone into Iraq 12 years ago? No. <laughs> no. Uh, all the way at the very back. Mr. Secretary. If uh, the United States was to be embroiled in another conflict in the Middle East, to what extent would that prevent us from completing our pivot? I can't to hear you. What, what, I got If we become embroiled in another conflict in the Middle we were, East. If we were embroiled in another conflict yeah. in the Middle East, to what extent would that preclude us from completing our pivot to Asia, and what would be the implications of that? Well, I don't know, because that's really a military question. I don't know how you, how you measure being embroiled in another conflict. If you mean a full-scale war with boots on the ground and everything, it will, it will diminish the ability to pivot to Asia, of course. Uh, but it'll do more than that, in my view. I, I think, I really believe that, that uh, I'm, not, I'm not an isolationist or a protectionist. I'm, I'm one who believes the United States has got to be involved. But we, got, we can't be the policeman for the world. And we've got, to, we've got to be very careful about sending our young men and women over to die in these conflicts in foreign, in foreign lands unless they are conflicts that, that impact our, our strong national security interests. I mean, they've got to be really important. You've got to have a serious national interest at stake when you decide you're going to commit American uh, men and women to harm and put them in harm's way. If you don't, then you'll lose support. The American people will abandon you the way they did in Vietnam, the way did, they did in the second Iraq war. And so you have to have a national interest at stake. And, and that means where you, when you're going to start sending, when the body bags start coming home, you're going to lose the policy if you don't have a serious national interest at stake. It's not enough to say, we're going to go over there and stop the slaughter, or we're going to, we are going to prohibit gen genocide or something. We can't do that. We don't have the ability to be the policeman for the world. Well, Secretary Baker, thank you very much for gracing our applause. Thank you. You're very welcome.